Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar that is hosted by Advanced Health in participation with Dubai Science Park, Connect Communication and Synapse Medical. We are delighted today to be bringing you a distinguished list of speakers to talking about the mental health challenge um, during the COVID-19 period. Um, we have a great list of speakers today with us, starting with Dr. Adil Tajwani. Um, Dr. Adil is a family physician and a member of the National Awareness Team for COVID-19, um, working with the Minister of Health, and he is also the Program Director of GP Training in the UAE Ministry of Health. Uh, my other co-panelist is Dr. Mohammed Tahir. Dr. Mohammed is a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist, founding member of the Emirates Society for Children and Adolescent Mental Health. And we also have um, Dr. Sarah Rasmi, who is a licensed psychologist and a managing director and owner of Thrive Wellbeing Center in Dubai. She is also a professor in the American University of Sharjah. And lastly, we have with us Mahar Al Hassan, who is the Vice President and General Manager for medical technology firm BD for the MENA region and Saudi Arabia. I'd like to start this discussion uh, by just saying that, uh, you know, we are at a very special time uh, that everyone is experiencing, whether we are um, professional healthcare workers, uh, parents, um, this is something that, uh, you know, is, is very special. And I think um, the mental health aspect of it is very important. And this is what we want to talk about and discuss in length today. Um, and I'd like to start with Dr. Uh, Adil. Um, since, you know, you are uh, at the front lines uh, confronting the COVID-19. Um, on, on a personal level, let's just start there. How has it impacted you uh, personally? Yeah, first of all, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this lovely webinar. Uh, on a personal level, actually, it has affected us a lot because, you know, uh, doctors and nurses and all healthcare professionals used to work hardly the previous uh, years, but now with the COVID-19, all our vacations and leave were canceled. And we have to work extra hours to save the, uh, the society of the United Arab Emirates people. So what happened, those who were working with cold cases, we were pushed to work with the isolation and quarantine patients. While the hospitals, right. uh, uh, hospital doctors Oh, every one of them is now an emergency physician. So you can, can, can you imagine, mm -hmm. for example, a dermatologist or an ophthalmologist who used to work with this such lovely environment, now he's, he's forced uh, to see emergency patients. Because, you know, the number of uh, cases worldwide in COVID-19 is increasing dramatically. Uh, fortunately, yeah. we have everything under control here in UAE. But again, uh, the, uh, the 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 number of cases is about uh, 560 per day, and uh, mm -hmm. everybody has to work in here. It's not the role, of, uh, not the role of the job only for emergency physicians or uh, or uh, ER people. So what we did, mm -hmm. we pushed all the symptomatic, asymptomatic patients, patients with no symptoms are now being managed with the primary care physicians, those who are called family physicians, GPs, or uh, primary care uh, doctors. So they are managing the large portion of those patients who are there in the primary care or in four or five star hotels under quarantine or under isolation. Uh, they are working day and night. Our PHCs, our primary care clinics are working 24 hours. So, uh, and the hospitals are managing the moderate to severe cases. So uh, you can imagine the huge workload on these doctors. Some of them, they cannot see their family. I, some of them, uh, they, they haven't been able to see their, their kids for the past two or three months mm -hmm. because the risk yeah. of, uh, yeah. of 
uh, giving the infection to their relative is high. Uh, so some of the mm -hmm. physicians, uh, they now they are now living in uh, private apartments. Some of them they are living in isolation in a room in their uh, hot in their house, like me myself. So uh, yeah, the burnout uh, rate is very high. The, uh, mm -hmm. the workload is too much for the doctor and nurses now. But again, uh, it's an emergency. We are now facing an emergency. I call it a medical war. And one day, inshallah, we will be able to overcome it. It's a challenge. Inshallah. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Muhammad Tahir, if, if I move to you and, and talk about, uh, you know, the, the key mental health and psychological issues uh, that are faced by, by, the, by the children, um, um, how, is it, how has that emerged? How is it impacting kids in specific? Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for uh, such a wonderful webinar and informative session. Uh, being a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I do see the families and the children and uh, having uh, noticed this COVID-19 grand scale infectivity casualties and the news around the world, uh, starting from one end of the world to the everywhere, and it's almost every channel you open up, you will hear this uh, information, and it seems like a scoreboard, like how many people, but these are real people, and you can imagine how it can impact even the adults, the family members, the uh, the people who who is uh, watching these news more and more often, which I will talk later, not to watch so much. Um, mm -hmm. I start discussion with the anxiety is contagious. The children, right. depending on their age, they don't have a much uh, comprehension about the situation. For example, four-year-old, the comprehension is different than the eight-year-old, and uh, eight-year is different than the 16-year-old adolescent. So. And the parents, oftentimes, I get the calls and the emails, questions, how to address their question. Should we answer all their questions? Should we give them the information? So all mm -hmm. these questions are coming from the parents, which shows that they are already noticing the anxiety and the stress in the children. And uh, as right. you know, the anxiety is created with the uncertainty unpredictability and lack of control, which we are mm -hmm. realizing in this current uh, worldwide pandemic situation. In addition to that, right. the families are affected with the financial steps. If the children say, yes, we are not going to the school, can we go out? Can we go to the mall? Can we go to the um, rides or something? The parents have no answer except to say, oh, Corona is there. There is uh, mm -hmm. some people mm -hmm. Uh, innocent and they say okay can corona go out for one day so that we can go out so mm -hmm. this is uh, innocent, but as well as very very painful how dearly they want to go out and they have their activities so children yes. are affected much but uh, what can we do uh, coming to that is uh, the parents, I will answer first very important question, and the many people ask the question, how should we answer the mm -hmm. children's questions? Too much. But from a, from a fundamental level, Dr. Mohammed, how, what is the difference between the, the mental capacity of adults versus children? How do you distinguish uh, those two? Uh, thank you. I'm coming to that. Uh, Okay. This is very difficult even for the experienced clinicians to assess the child's capacity or their mental level mm -hmm. in uh, simple terms, IQ level or something. But I can right. tell you the easy thing, uh, easy uh, tool to use while addressing to the child is ask their question and try to understand what level their question is. Are they are asking mm -hmm. about, oh, this virus, how big is this? Is this close to elephant or close to the uh, buffalo or close to something? This can tell mm -hmm. you their mental capacity or their understanding. Or if some adolescent is asking you, oh, by the way, it has a, a RNA or DNA virus. It has a coating or not. How it is uh, 
you know, replicate the time of replication and other things. So then you can know their capacity to understand and their capacity to comprehend the matter. So simple mm -hmm. rule of thumb is that for the children, too much is not too good. And too little right. will not address the issue and anxiety. So I would say mm -hmm. in each individual child, please address their questions, whatever they are asking, but please do not hide or do not try to steer away from that because that will create more anxiety in the children. We have to address the question, but we can try to answer as much as they can understand and comprehend. And I always okay. say in the children and even in the adults, there is two-way communication. When you are looking mm -hmm. into the yeah. eyes of a child, you are talking to them, you can understand the information you are providing is making them more anxious or making them mm -hmm. in control and more relaxed. So use your judgment sure. and trust your judgment and try not to give too much information. End of the day, mm -hmm. they cannot do much. They cannot contribute uh, much towards this uh, issue. But when you make them relax, at least they can function in the home environment. They can do the homeschooling and they will provide a like good uh, relaxed environment. So try to relax them, but don't lie to them. You know, don't right, hide right. the okay. truth from them, Excellent. but don't expose too much. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Dr. Sar, if I move to you and talk about emotions a little bit, because I know that sometimes, uh, you know, adults as, as well as children can become very emotional when it comes to the situation. Uh, and I think, you know, given the uncertainty and, you know, I get this question all the time from my kids, when will this finish? Mm -hmm. When are we going to go back to normal? And, you know, parents are also not in a situation to give clear answers. And I think this is something that, uh, you know, adds to the to the fire, uh, as they mm -hmm. say. So what are strategies that can be adopted by parents at these difficult times? So first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. And also, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of the frontline workers, our health heroes during this difficult time. Mm -hmm. Now, with regards to the question that you've asked me, it's something that a lot of people in the community have been approaching us with. And I think the important thing mm -hmm. for us to all remember is that when we do find ourselves in these times of novelty and ambiguity and unpredictability, that it does breed fear and stress and worry, and that's normal and we're not alone. So normalizing mm -hmm. the experience, I think, is something that is incredibly important. But I think that what we mm -hmm. need to do as well, not just as, uh, as parents, but as individuals, is to try to gain as much sort of structure and routine and control and control. So the difficulty with COVID-19 is the fact that it's something that has changed so dramatically. Our knowledge and understanding of it has really rapidly evolved where we were a week or eight weeks ago versus where we might be in a week or eight weeks. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. So whatever we can control mm -hmm. in our environment, those are the things that we want to do. The uh, routine that we can implement within our homes, I think is absolutely important. But I also think that it's right. important for us, going back to my initial point about normalizing the emotions and the experience. Every single one of us has good days and has bad days, and that's just part mm -hmm. of the process. It's also important to remember that it's okay for us to experience negative emotions and for our children to experience negative emotions as well. And for us to have those things arise as a result of things that to the outlooker might seem very minor. I have a lot of people that come and tell me things like, you know, I had a really hard day yesterday because I was missing my colleagues and having, you know, our, our lunch break together or, or chatting in the hallway between meetings. And I feel terrible about that because so many people are not healthy. So many people are experiencing the financial and economic implications of this crisis sort of all over the world. But it's okay. It's a period of collective grief. And it's okay for us to mourn the little things as well as the big things. So normalizing the experience mm -hmm. and gaining control are my two big takeaway messages. Okay. 
Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Um, Mahar Al Hassan, from a corporate perspective, um, you know, BD is one of the leading firms when it comes to medical, medical technology. How can people develop healthy mental habits? And how can creating a resilience plan help to tackle the uncertainty facing people around the world? Yes, um, uh, th thank you. Um, thank you, Marwan. Um, I mean, I think this, uh, this uh, got us all in, uh, I mean, we, we were all surprised by, by what's happening, but, what, uh, but how it started, the, the, the COVID-19 issue. And um, uh, we're learning by doing, uh, I would say. So uh, personally, uh, as, uh, as one member of this panel, I'm not the, the subject matter expert when it comes to, uh, uh, to mental health, but probably we develop this, uh, uh, this skill uh, by, um, uh, by doing and by communicating and by uh, also listening to those kind of, uh, of, uh, of webinars and uh, also connecting with the, the subject matter expert in terms of the, uh, the mental the, the healthy mental habits. So um, one thing for sure is that we as, um, as an organization or as people, we're all people in this organization, we're all experiencing unexpected uh, change. So we feel that there is a, a loss of our daily routine, uh, which is uh, getting up in the morning, going to, going to work, achieving and coming back at night. Uh, we have seen um, a loss of uh, physical uh, connection and uh, presence. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as team members as well, uh, we have seen increased anxiety uh, to balance the professional and the personal demand. Because now, while we're working from home, we're, we're, mo we're working even more than what we used to, mm -hmm. uh, to do in the office. Uh, because in the office, you go to the office, you disconnect, and you come, you come back. Now here, we're, we're working, we're trying to, um, to balance the professional and the, the personal demands, knowing that both have increased. Uh, on, on, mm -hmm. on both sides. Um, so right. the, there are also concerns about the continuity of life uh, as usual, concerns about the, our own well-being. As a responsible person for uh, uh, 200 people here in the, in the region, I'm concerned about the, uh, the team's well-being, the, their individual well-being. Add to that the, um, uh, the, the stress and uh, how, uh, how the individual go through the stress in terms of the uh, denial phase, the anger phase, depression, uh, then starts going up into the bargaining and then the acceptance, which is a cycle that we're, uh, we're also um, experiencing here. So um, mm -hmm. the, the, the most important thing about uh, really uh, tackling this, uh, this uncertainty as, uh, as a team, but also as individual, is um, when we know what is happening and we know what we expect, we, start, we then feel safe. Uh, so even if what, we, if what we feel or even if what we expect might be threatening, at least if we know it, if we expect it, then we, we feel that we can do something about it. So this is, uh, this is the, the important area of why we need to create this uh, resilience uh, plan, uh, the, the personal resilience plan that you that you were mentioning. And first, it starts with the identification of our anxiety, to know where the anxiety is coming from. So what we can do is to identify what are the different sources of our current anxiety, put them in a realistic expect perspective, accept them, deal with the things uh, that are more immediate. So put the anxiety aside and try to, to deal with more Im immediate things. Uh, this will help us calm down and gain, gain probably better control and uh, perspective. Then we have to uh, go for facts. So uh, anxiety escalates and uh, fantasies, they flourish in the absence of information. So let's follow mm -hmm. the facts we have. Pay attention to our own most valued sources of information and follow up. Uh, follow up to date uh, instruction, follow up regularly on them without really putting a lot of uh, focus, but really understand the facts. Then it's important to connect to positivity, connect with friends uh, who are optimistic, uh, limit conversations about the current situation to a period of time, to, to a short period of time per day. Talk about it, but not uh, spend the whole day talking about it. Uh, share positive mm -hmm. stories on social media, read books, watch movies, uh, 
uh, that where you can learn from. Uh, so uh, I personally have changed uh, over the period of uh, the, the lockdown of two months now, uh, or six weeks. Uh, so um, I'm getting used to things that uh, uh, my kids are used to. So I'm sharing with them more as a, as a family member. Um, also, uh, plan with your best friend. Talk about new opportunities. What could this bring as, um, as, a, as an opportunity? Plan healthy meals, plan your exercise, plan your work, uh, make sure that you disconnect at the end of the day. And uh, we have what we say, we have been saying, take the T challenge, the T-E-A, we call it T, because it's about thoughts, emotions, and actions. So we know very well that our thoughts affect our emotions, and our emotions affect our actions. So we uh, we have to learn how to say stop to, uh, to our thoughts in terms of bad thoughts, and be more positive, think more positively, because positive thoughts will create positive emotions that will create positive uh, action. And very important, as also as a leader, is to show empathy. So um, it, is, it is very important to show, to, to show empathy to, uh, to, to the people, to, the, to your team, uh, to, the, uh, to, to, to your family. So this is, uh, there is, this is my take on how we could uh, probably create a, a resilience plan as, um, as professionals. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Maher. Um, we were receiving some questions from the audience, so I'd like to encourage everyone to submit their questions and we will be uh, channeling it to the right uh, uh, panelists. Um, if I go back to you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Adil, um, what measures have been put in place to protect the, the, me the mental health of employees and the health workers uh, and prevent the effects of burnout. This question is from Khawla. Um, go ahead, please. Yeah, this is a very challenging question because uh, with the normal scenarios before COVID-19, uh, such measures were not approached by the physician and nurses because uh, from nature of their work, they think that they are strong enough to handle themselves. So most of the occupational health and psychologists and healthcare uh, entities were not approached by the doctor and nurses. They are usually approached by administrative people. So can mm -hmm. you imagine now with COVID-19 where the most of our uh, doctors and nurses are expats, are not UAE nationals? And many of them are living alone. So you, can you imagine they are working now over time dealing with COVID-19 positive patients? And uh, again, they have uh, their families are not here. They are not living with their families. Mm -hmm. And they are not allowed to go out. And they are not allowed to uh, all the malls and shops are were closed for some time. So the issue of burnout and the depression is really high. Now, we, we, ha we have the staff clinic. We do talk to them for mindfulness. We have a hotline for mental health issues for the employees. But again, if I'm depressed myself, if, I'm feeling, if I am feeling burnout myself, will I go to such clinics? No, the, the percentage uh, is very low. Uh, although the, the, the rate of depression between healthcare workers is very high, the issue of suicide worldwide in doctors and nurses mm -hmm. is double comparing to the whole population. But why they, they don't mm -hmm. go and reach, and, and reach help? Well, because they, they, they feel, they, so, they are fearing the social stigma. Uh, they think mm -hmm. that uh, doctors and nurses are strong enough and it's their job and sh they should not go and seek help because everybody will keep looking at them. Some of them uh, is, is afraid of, of uh, ruining their reputation. Well, see that doctor, mm -hmm. uh, he's going, he's depressed, uh, so I'm not gonna find another job again. This doctor. I cannot handle depression. This is a very huge mm -hmm. challenge, especially in our culture here in UAE, where everybody is talking and uh, they, they don't handle depression very well in, in the society. Again, when it comes now to COVID-19, we are doing our best to handle it. But again, the issue of COVID-19 is way more powerful than uh, our mental capacity uh, in healthcare workers. Uh, we advise those people to call the hotline for mental health. Psychologists are there, psychiatrists are there, but uh, mm -hmm. they, 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 don't, they don't go actually. Then the number of the doctors and nurses, they don't call so frequent to reach help. We are having the issue yeah. uh, of the junior doctors, or what we call them residents. Residents, those are mm -hmm. the junior doctors who are uh, now in the specialty, they are specializing now in the specialty uh, 
uh, time. So yeah, they are more fragile. They usually, uh, because they are more educated maybe, and they receive the more modern education. So they mm -hmm. are reaching more than the old doctor. So the old feel very, uh, very big and grandiosity in uh, some way. So they don't seek help. After some time, they get mental breakdown, actually, because they don't seek help. Mm -hmm. But the junior doctors, no, we are much more, much more happy with them. They, they come and they seek help and they don't feel it that way. So Correct. As as a government, as a government, we do our best, but the the, the COVID nineteen is way more powerful than all governments in the world. So uh, what we can do now is balancing. Balancing means we are trying our best to prevent and to treat patients in the society, and this is the job of the first line of defense doctors and nurses. But again, the mental health of doctors and and nurses, whatever you do, it's really a big challenge nowadays. Mm -hmm. well, just a follow-up question for you, Dr. Adil. Um, we have a question from Ra uh, Rami Rajab. Um, do you think there will be a, a shortage of health workers due to, to stress and the experience the health workers are going through currently? Well, uh, it, it will be. It will be. Here in UAE, we don't feel shortage, alhamdulillah, till now. Uh, mm -hmm. We are working really in a good number because from the beginning, we shifted all of the asymptomatic patients, which is the largest proportion of COVID-19. We shifted them to primary care physicians. So that yes. gave us a very powerful thing. We don't have surge on the hospital. So the hospitals are really doing good, actually. We are not doing like China, Italy, or United States. We are much better in the hospital mm -hmm. capacity. But again, mm -hmm. what's what will happen is after COVID-19, post-COVID-19, whenever COVID-19 mm -hmm. is finished, I think we'll have a huge mental disorders and psychiatric diseases with healthcare workers because all, mm -hmm. this, all this time they have been working really hard. They have, as I said, many of them are living alone. The issue of loneliness, mm -hmm. the issue of balancing between work and family. Is many, many of my colleagues haven't been able to see their kids for the past three months yet. So, Post COVID nineteen, after COVID nineteen, it's a big challenge, and I think the government should tackle it very well uh, in order not to mm -hmm. lose them. Okay, excellent, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Muhammad Tahar. Um, we have no. a question from a lady Diala, who is uh, saying that her child is afraid to go outside, and this was precisely my question about parents. What can we do? to keep our kids happy and engaged while we're also juggling responsibilities between work and, and family. Mm -hmm. um, again, the continuation of the anxiety and stress in the children, answer their questions, relax them, and uh, mm -hmm. do not give them too much information if they are able to, yeah, I mean, if they're a little bit uh, older, uh, and they can watch news, limit their uh, news watching strategies and the timings. Just uh, make it like once a day or twice a day. Don't let them and answer their mm -hmm. questions. Um, right. I have also noticed that in general, the, if the children, because of the stress of the studies and the environment in the school and otherwise, some of the children, they are just barely making it. They do not, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they are not having a full-fledged anxiety. So this right. situation and staying home might have tipped them over and they are becoming more anxious and nervous. So those kids for now, I mean, if they are showing the symptoms of restlessness, panics, or sleeping problems, or irritability, or anger, mm -hmm. And actually, mm -hmm. uh, adolescent children and even 10, 11, 12-year-old and older children, the only symptom can be only aggression or anger or mm -hmm. agitation. So these symptoms should not be taken as a norm for the adolescent or anything. We should seek help. I mean, I know we are keeping the social distancing, but online consults are available and the help is available. So we should not delay it. Some of the parents, they were saying, okay, when the COVID-19 will be over, we will make an appointment, we'll go see the psychologist, we'll go see the psychiatrist. And I said, no, you don't need to wait for this because uh, you don't let it uh, keep going on because for you, this is days and night, but for the children who are feeling anxious and nervous, it can be minutes and hours. The more time elapses and seeing and hearing and hearing the parents talking, 
it can make them more anxious and nervous so don't delay the treatment i think to catch early stage mm-hmm. is much more important also advice for the parents and ourselves as well the parents should avoid discussing uh, the uh, the the difficult part of the covid 19 like i ha- i heard some parents were talking about oh there are so many casualties in new york oh, you know honey john when mm-hmm. you were in new mm-hmm. york it's a beautiful city and right. everything now everybody there is so please don't tell them don't uh, don't uh, have them recall expose those them. situations and tell them there are people you yeah, don't expose to them those things although they are realities but they are not ready to face it even for the adults we uh, we suggest them that do not watch news too much this is a grand grand mm-hmm. catastrophe on the earth on the uh, on the yes. humanity yes. so please take it sure. as For is sure. help as much as you can help and uh, for the children keep them under your wings and don't give expose right. to them uh, for the too much information which they don't need it right thank you um sarah if we if we look at um, you know our screen time not just for for uh, the kids but also i think equally the adults uh, it has definitely increased because of uh, us staying indoors um what advice would you have for family members in order to deal with, with this together and make sure that they get time away from the from the screens I think one of the very important things that we need to do is we need to practice a little bit of self-compassion and also be a bit more compassionate towards people who are living with us in our homes as well as people that we're connected to outside of the home. A lot of parents mm-hmm. are concerned about screen time because we know that it has some negative correlates, but at the end of the mm-hmm. day, unfortunately, right, we have to increase mm-hmm. our screen time in order to maintain e-learning and in order for us to have webinars and learn from one another like we're doing today and to continue to operate our our businesses as normal so it's part of the situation and remembering mm-hmm. that at the end of the day we're just trying to do our best and to take each day at a time goes a long way mm-hmm. to kind of facilitating that compassion so i think that's really key right. i think that we want of course to have non-screen time and for people mm-hmm. who have access to outdoor space whether it's in their own private homes or for people who have access to a community that they can use if they feel comfortable going outside and having that fresh air it is really helpful in terms of of stress reduction and in terms of physical exercise i think one mm-hmm. of the things that people struggle with a lot is this idea particularly since uh, it's been a little while since we've all been spending this much time at home there's this mentality that we should be using this time to grow and to develop and to be productive and to do all of these sorts of things and so we're adding a lot mm-hmm. of pressure and sometimes that pressure comes even with, with lifestyle related factors so we know that physical exercise is important and a lot of people aren't working out anymore because maybe they don't have access to things at home and their motivation levels have decreased but yet they're endeavoring right. or think that they should be holding themselves to these incredibly high standards and that it's either i do nothing or i'm extremely mm-hmm. fit so we need to manage our expectations a little bit and there's a tool that mm-hmm. i use a lot of the time with community members and also with my clients and basically what it is is a behavioral experiment and it's this idea okay. that in order for us to change our behavior it requires a lot of energy and resources when we're stressed mm-hmm. worried and anxious our body tries to hang on to those resources as much as possible so we're fighting almost mm-hmm. a losing battle so what we can do right. is we can try to alleviate some of that pressure by saying i'm not going to turn into a bodybuilder by the end of this period mm-hmm. i'm not going to turn into a michelin star chef who only eats organic and gluten free and all of this <laughs> stuff by the end of this period but what mm-hmm. i'm going to do is i'm going to commit for 5 to 7 days to implementing mm-hmm. this behavior that i know and that science tells me is good for me and then we collect the data yeah. for the 5 to 7 days we evaluate how we were feeling in the lead up and usually in the lead up there's an element of of dread honestly speaking um we evaluate how we're feeling while we're engaging in that behavior and importantly we evaluate how we're feeling after the fact and as a result right. of that data collection we can determine 
which of the behavioral practices and strategies we want to add into our own personal toolkit. So collecting mm -hmm. data is something that's important to do and alleviating some of those pressures and expectations is, is, is very important. Having um, okay. healthier lifestyle choices is really key as well. But being compassionate is like my number one message that I wish to give to everybody who is listening to this, regardless of what population you belong to, it's a really difficult time and we're doing the best that mm -hmm. we can and mm -hmm. there will be a roller coaster of emotions and, and that's okay. Right, excellent, very good. Thank you very much. This, this answers you know, my question and also a question that we got from uh, Osama Al-Malki uh, who was asking about uh, the impact of lockdown for, uh, for children. Um, if I turn back to uh, Nahar Al Hassan one more time um, and ask about yes. the measures, the internal measures, uh, we want to know that we have a lot of sources listening here with us. Um, we want to, you know, hear a little bit more about the internal measures that BD has put in place to protect the emotional well-being of its employees. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Marwan. Uh, yes, this is uh, this is a very important uh, uh, area here. And uh, again, as I said earlier, we're, we're learning by uh, uh, by doing. Um, uh, now, uh, we, we have uh, we've worked in parallel on two uh, on two areas here: the internal one, which is our associates, but also we did not want to uh, leave the uh, our uh, our dear frontliners. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, medical workers, the uh, the HCPs who are um, who are in the field, and uh, they are basically the ones who are uh, fighting this war and this battle. So it is very important for us to first, uh, again, as uh, Dr. Sarah was mentioning, to, feel, to to show compassion and to to show appreciation is to thank the the frontliners for being tireless, selfless, and and really brave in um, in, in this um, in this war and this situation. So we have done several campaigns. Um, we have connected with the, uh, with, the, with with our uh, with our clients and customers across. And you cannot imagine the uh, the appreciation that we have received because we're, we're we're thinking about them. And you can see also from what's happening worldwide how uh, people can go on the street, applaud them, and thank them. So we have done uh, kind of the same, adapted to um, to the region here. Is that. Uh, Thank you. Those thank you campaigns. So this is in terms of the um, of the healthcare um, workers. Now, in terms of uh, BD and and internally, um, uh, definitely the the, the 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 thing the most important thing is to connect and to communicate. So probably this is uh, mm -hmm. one of the uh, I mean the, the times the past six weeks that uh, I've seen my agenda fully. Uh, booked just for uh, connecting, for communicating with the team to make sure they are uh, well, that the uh, that we're serving our customers to the uh, to the last bit. So, uh, so the communication aspect is is extremely uh, important. We we also did some internal webinars on, uh, on mental health and and social well um, and well being. So uh, we I personally started with having like. Uh, uh, video messages. Uh, so our CEO addressed us by video messages. I did the same thing for the region. So these uh, videos were disseminated weekly to all staff with the objective of keeping our associates informed, engaged, uh, motivated, and to also uh, calm any and answer any um, and any issue they uh, they may have. Uh, mm -hmm. I've also started doing what we call, uh, I mean, uh, coffee break sessions. So virtual coffee break sessions. So just mm -hmm. having coffee virtually with the team, inviting everyone to be on a, on a coffee break, uh, and then and then discuss uh, things that have nothing to do with the, with business, and just connect and uh, and it was really and and it was fun. We also had our town halls um, on Microsoft mm -hmm. Teams. Um, so this is again a way of connecting uh, to to right. again encourage and maintain connect uh, connectivity uh, uh, within the organization and listen to them. I also ask them, mm -hmm. so what do you think how life will be after COVID-19? And then you'll have those uh, ideas, some crazy ideas, some normal ideas coming in. Um, the other thing is that from a communication perspective, we start sending uh, what we call uh, awareness flyers. We call them in a nutshell, awareness flyers. 
that are distributed weekly, addressing a variety of uh, effectiveness tips around health and wellness topics. Um, we also had a campaign about choosing to stay positive. Uh, so implementing this challenge to encourage associates to share images, experiences, whether a picture or a movie of what they're doing at home. So some of us would show us how they are cycling at home, how they are uh, um, uh, doing exercise at home or cooking. So we had this uh, uh, hashtag, I choose to stay positive, uh, positive campaign uh, as well. Okay. Recognizing our heroes, because we also have our teams who are supporting the, um, uh, the, the healthcare uh, workers in the field uh, in, in making sure that the, the, the machines are uh, working well, the, the, uh, the instruments. And we also uh, uh, initiated what we call the Employee Assistance Program, which is a counseling for emotional and psychological support, which is a practical guidance and support on legal, financial, family, work matters, uh, online health and well-being resource. Uh, uh, so to make sure that everything is accessible to them. Excellent, very good. Um, if I jump uh, back to Dr. Adel, uh, Dr. Adel, as a family physician, um, I was wondering if you can give us advice to ensure the emotional, physical well-being of older people um, uh, who are staying at home. What would you, what would you advise? Well, uh, what we know from uh, COVID-19 that uh, it, when it affects people, the old people, especially those with chronic diseases, uh, tend to have a more uh, advanced disease or tend to have more complications. So we advise all old people to stay home. This time. And staying home has the negative effect on many people. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, myself. If I stay home for three months, I'll have so much, uh, uh, so much effect. So imagine an old man on, on, or an old lady who, who who has chronic diseases such as diabetes, or hypertension, or asthma, or multiple chronic diseases, and you tell them or her to stay home because COVID-19 uh, gives you a much more critical illness. This will affect their mental health so much because he will be afraid that uh, mentally he will, uh, he, that he, more, uh, he will get the disease and if he gets the, the disease, he will die. And again, all people, they don't work. They, they are used to stay with their family, kids and children or hanging out with their friends, talking. And old people, they don't know how to use the uh, recent uh, technological uh, equipment, such as they don't know how to use video calling and or uh, other things. So we advise them uh, to do the following. First of all, staying home is for your own health. So uh, if you, uh, they, they should they should know this very well that we we are, we know that COVID nineteen affects their health more than the others. That's why staying home is part of their treatment. And it's I think the duty of the younger people at home to teach them how to use this technology. Uh, the old man he or the old lady she 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 wants to see she wants to see her kids or grand or grandchildren so uh, if I'm a young person uh, and sure I am but I should go to my grandfather or my father and teach him how to use video call and how to use to use zoom Microsoft team skype whatever so uh, making him physical distance Distancing, social distancing is the important. So making him physically away from people, but socially so close with them. So he can call mm -hmm. his friends, and he, he can chat with them, he can chat with his uh, grandchildren. And again, uh, it depends also on the culture and, and the religion. So if some people, if some old people, they are more religious, we can get this time into making them more attached to their religion and praying more. If they are not, we can, for example, see what are their hobbies, providing some books for them, providing, I don't know, some, if they like exercising, if they like cooking.
So uh, mental health of all people is something really, really important. If, the, if this old man or old lady is highly educated, so we should tell them and teach them about COVID-19 and get them updated. If he is not or she is not well educated, then we should give them the information in a very simple way. You will be amazed that even children, as my colleagues uh, just mentioned, Dr. Mohammed Tahir, uh, even children, some of them, they know more about the disease more than us because they go to the internet and they see everything. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they expect people not to know, but they know, they know much more than us. So for old people, my advice is don't let them socially distance, make them physically distance by uh, teaching them how to use the video calling, by uh, providing them what, uh, whatever they need at home, books or uh, classes, cooking, gyms, uh, exercising mm -hmm. at home, so uh, and educating them. The WHO, the World Health Organization, advise everyone, not only all people, not to hear or listen to COVID-19 news every day. I mean, why mm -hmm. we are hearing mm -hmm. it? As doctors or nurses, uh, we, are, we, we are updating ourselves with COVID-19 because this is our field. But if you are staying mm -hmm. home, what is the or the death rate of COVID-19. Are you asking yourself, okay, when is the treatment? Uh, when is the treatment mm -hmm. will be there? Is, it, is, is China invading U.S.? Is U.S. pressuring China? I mean, why you are caring so much about this? What, what it's, right. it's your duty now. It's, it's your duty now to enjoy your life at home. COVID-19 uh, made people more uh, attached to each other. Uh, far, right. uh, parents used not to see so the father will go to work and the mother used to go to work also the children will be sitting all the time half of their days at school now everybody is home mm -hmm. parents from home home everybody is talking that the father cannot go out with his friends the mother cannot go out to her so everybody now is attached to each other so we should get this opportunity yeah. to get more attached as a family this is now will improve our mental health we should not be alone the key to managing COVID-19 is not to be alone loneliness is killing people mentally and physically mental health mm -hmm. is the cause of many physical illnesses and uh, I'm sure that uh, my colleagues know that burnout uh, is, is will, will be considered uh, as a occupational phenomena that will cause depression and stress by the international classification yeah. of ICD-11 in 2022. So mm -hmm. the key to fighting burnout and stress and depression is not listening to COVID-19 music. Listen to something more useful to yourself. You, what you care now is prevention. Prevention is your duty. The treatment and medication is the duty of somebody else. So care about depression. Stay home. Take the preventive measures such as washing hands, sanitizing, washing these floors. And uh, if you're ordering food from outside, make sure to, t to uh, get rid of the bags and get rid of the plates. But again, uh, Use the time at home to get more attached to your family. Teach older mm -hmm. people to to get to know those iPads and tablet things. If yes. you might think that they don't know, they are old. No, they will know. If you know, then they will know. Just they need some more time. They need, they need your patience. They spend so much time with you, educating you till you became so much educated and technology freak. So I think mm -hmm. it's your duty now to pay by teaching them, and this will help them get more attached. For of example, course. I have yes. a grandmother who is above 85 years old, and now she's, she, doesn't, she, she, she's, she, she doesn't know how to write or read, by the way. Uh, and, uh, okay. But now she's using, she's using Zoom to video call with her mm -hmm. grandchildren. Can you imagine that? We spend so much time with her. Excellent. So now she's Zooming with us. Yeah, she's video calling with all her grandchildren. It can happen. And this is our duty mm -hmm. now. Uh, as younger generation to teach them and help them overcome their mental health at home, especially our older people. Excellent. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Sarah, we have a question from uh, Rina of uh, Mo Modark University uh, talking about disputes that can happen within family members uh, who are probably equally frustrated 
uh, due to the mm -hmm. lockdown. What do you suggest, uh, you know, how would family members be able to uh, resolve those issues or disputes? So I think maintaining social connections during this period is very, very important. But one of the things that mm -hmm. we need to address is this idea that we need to be connected to ourselves. And as a function of being at home and as a function of not having the barriers or the respites that we used to have when we were leaving the home, many of us are feeling detached from ourselves. And so right. I advise people, everybody, every single day to try to take some period of time, even if it's just a matter of three or five minutes, to themselves to be able to reconnect back with themselves. Because that gives mm -hmm. you the energy that you need to be able to navigate social relationships when they become challenging at home. So what do we do right. when things are starting to escalate at home and we're starting to feel frustrated by partners and by other people that we're living with? It's kind of a two-pronged approach that I recommend. The first prong mm -hmm. is more preventative. So we want to try to increase positivity in our relationship. And the strategies I'm going to mention now are things we can use with a romantic partner, but also with our children and also with other members of our household. So taking an opportunity on a daily basis to say our appreciation and express admiration to the people that we love is a really, really mm -hmm. good way to practice gratitude, to make them feel loved, to make them feel admired, and then we receive. So it's meant to be a reciprocal process that helps increase positivity in our relationship. That's very, very key. The other thing is mm -hmm. when things are starting to escalate and get difficult, we need to try to intervene as early as possible. Every single one mm -hmm. of us has our warning signs when we're starting to get physiologically aroused or flooded, right? You might notice mm -hmm. something that's changing in your body. You might notice an emotional response. You might have certain thought processes. So once you observe mm -hmm. this, the best thing that we can do is we can remove ourselves from the situation. But when we're removing ourselves from a situation, we need to be very careful with how we message that to the person around us. If we simply say mm -hmm. something like, I just can't do this right now mm -hmm. and storm off, then usually what that invites is the person coming after us and then there's an escalation of the problem. So what we need to do when we're feeling frustrated with somebody is we need to make it inclusive and make it a we issue rather than an I versus, uh, versus you issue. So saying something along mm -hmm. the lines of, our conversation is not very productive at the moment. I think it's best mm -hmm. for us to take a couple of hours to go regroup and then come back and address this issue. Now, okay. when we take those couple of hours, we need to make sure that during those couple of hours, or I mean, it can be anything between 30 minutes and 24 and 24 hours. We need to be mm -hmm. able to do something that relaxes us and reduces our stress because studies have shown that when we do that in the middle of a potential argument, it really can transform it into a more productive discussion rather than something really heated and counterproductive. So we need to do that. And we need to have mm -hmm. this time limit because usually, like I was alluding to earlier, there will be one person who will want to exit the situation and the other person will feel very, very threatened in that moment and dig their heels in a little bit deeper. So when we give them a fixed period of time, when we say let's regroup, let's say in two hours, then they know. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Excellent. Um, since we're, we're left only with, with a few more minutes, um, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Sarah, um, for for a, a very you know quick takeaway from from our discussion. What is one thing that you'd like people to take away from from today's webinar, from your perspective? Manage your expectations, be kind to yourself, and realize that there are going to be days that are better than others, and that's okay. It's part mm -hmm. of the process. Right. Mahar al Hassan, what would, what would you suggest? One takeaway from our talk today. I mean, again, this is uh, just to uh, communicate as much as possible, connect um, with your people, 
show compassion. Um, don't estimate that, uh, I mean, we're all the same. Uh, this is a difficult period of time, and we would just uh, need to make sure that we are uh, we, we are handling it, um, uh, we're handling it properly with, uh, with, our, uh, with our people here. So uh, we should not assume that uh, the, they, they have the time to do, to do everything. So, so as leaders, probably we need to, to make sure that uh, our associates uh, have the right time to prioritize, to focus, to communicate, and, and we need to recognize as well uh, their, uh, their, 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 uh, <laughs> their work and make sure that uh, we overload them, we underload them because uh, we don't need to uh, to overload them with meetings and with having separate schedules. So we should uh, avoid assumption uh, and and the, um, we have to have the right expectation from each and every associate. Of course. Right. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Tahar, what would you suggest uh, family members? Um, what is one thing that you will tell all parents during this time? Sure. Um, I think the big thing is uh, positive thinking about it. It's going to be over. This is a difficult time. We stick together, mm -hmm. socialize, mm -hmm. and I think a uh, lot of good things have been said by colleagues. I reinforce that. But in addition to that, spend more time with the children if you have and the uh, elderly people because these two groups are usually people don't have time to spend time with them. In the current situation, we are very, very busy. I mean, if, if I look at my life, I hardly remember there was any time in my life when, when I have so much time to spend with my family. Yes, we are working from home. Uh, but this is the same time you keep the hopes up and hope for the best. Once this is over, we'll get back to the normal. And think about it, you are the leader, just like a captain of the ship. I actually mm -hmm. uh, pleasantly talk to my wife and children. I'm telling them, okay, if you think I'm the captain of the ship, I order you to please smile and laugh and tell me one good thing about it, anything. Right. So keeping right. the hopes high and keeping the positive thinking. And on top of that, I like to give. And I'm telling them any way you can do, you can donate through online, you can say a good word to the doctor, healthcare professional, or you can say good words to the social worker who is doing the work. Giving is a medicine during this time, if you just want to say one line of the words. The giving, mm -hmm. giving is a great thing. And especially the Ramadan is a month of giving. And we miss that uh, yeah. giving to the people and anything. Any, anybody who, I mean, when the lockdown is easy, anybody comes to your door, give them even a single penny. I mean, give them whatever you can, right. even a juice bottle or something. So giving, I think, is a big medicine during this time, in addition to the other things we said. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Adil, um, your final your final thoughts. Yeah, I think uh, agreeing with my colleagues, and I think uh, post COVID nineteen, after COVID nineteen, and it will it will go at one time, and will it will be memories. But uh, mm -hmm. what we will learn is that mental health is really important. I think the countries all over the world, globally, and here in UAE, we should concentrate more on mental health. As, as the physical health is, is, is important, also mental health is important. The, pers the rate of mental health disorders are increasing. It should not be a social stigma. Everybody should acknowledge that mental health is very normal and people should seek for help. So my advice is if you have a mental health disorder or, or if you are thinking so much, go and seek help. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like by this note i'd like to thank all the speakers all the participating participating speakers for your valuable time and for your valuable participation and also the audience and participants who have joined us from all over the world all the way from australia to saudi arabia and here in, in the uae thank you for your great questions we have many more questions that we have received but we are short on time and um, i'd like to say um, best wishes and we will definitely go through the, this uh, pandemic and you know in a, in a few months we'll be looking back and learning um, about best practices and i look forward to teach, uh, keeping in touch with all of you and perhaps 
uh, hosting another webinar to talk about um, other other lessons. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.